Hi everyone, uh, we're going to carry on with chapter 3 of Wind in the Willows and chapter 3 is called The Wild Wood. Ooh, sounds scary. The mole had long wanted to make the acquaintance of the badger. He seemed by all accounts to be such an important personage and though rarely visible to make his unseen influence felt by everybody about the place. But whenever Mole mentioned his wish to water rat, he always found himself put off. It's all right, the rat would say. Badger will turn up some day or other. He's always turning up, and then I'll introduce you. The best of fellows. But you must not only take him as you find him, but when you find him. Can you ask him here for dinner or something, said the Mole. He wouldn't come, replied the rat simply. Badger hates society and invitations and dinner and all that sort of thing. Well then, supposing we go and call on him, suggested the Mole. I'm sure he wouldn't like that at all, said the rat, quite alarmed. He's so very shy, he's sure to be offended. I never even ventured to call on him at his own home myself, though I know him so well. Besides, we can't. It's quite out of the question, because he lives in the very middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does, said the mole. You told me the wild wood was all right, you know. Oh, I know, I know, so it is, replied the rat evasively. But I think we won't go there just now, not just yet. It's a long way and he wouldn't be at home at this time of year anyhow. He'll be coming along some day, if you weigh quietly. The mole had to be content with this, but the badger never came along, and every day brought its, uh, brought its own amusements, and it was not till summer was long over and the cold frost and merry ways kept them much indoors, and the swollen river raced past their windows with a speed that mocked at boating of any sort of sort or kind, that he found his thoughts dwelling again with much persistence on the solitary grey badger, who lived his life by himself in his hole and in the middle of the wild wood. In the winter time, the rat slept a great deal, retiring early and rising late. During his short day, he sometimes scribbled poetry or did other small domestic jobs about the house, and of course there were always animals dropping in for a chat and consequently there was a good deal of storytelling and compar comparing notes on the past summer and all its doings. Such a rich chapter it had been, when one came to look, at, look back on it all, with illustrations so numerous and so highly coloured. The pageant of the rib bank had marched steadily along, unfolding itself in scene pictures that succeeded each other in stately procession. Purple loose strife arrived early, shaking luxuriant tangled locks along the edge of the mirror, whence its own face laughed back at it. Willow herb, tender and wistful like pink sunset cloud, was not slow to follow. Comfrey, the purple hand in, hand in hand with the white, crept forth to take his place in the line, and at last one morning the diffident and delaying dog rose stepped delicately onto the stage, and one knew, as if string music had announced it in stately chords, that strayed into a gavotte, that June at last was here. One member of the company was still awaited, the shepherd boy, for the nymphs to woo, the knight for whom the ladies waited at the window, the prince that was to kiss the sleeping summer back to life and love. But when Meadowsweet, Debonair and Odris in Amber Jerkin moved graciously to his place in the group, then the play was ready to begin. And what a play it had been! Drowsy animals, snug in their holes, while the wind and the rain were battering at their doors, recalled still keen mornings, an hour before sunrise, when the white mist, as yet undispersed, clung closely along the surface of the water. Then the shock of the early plunge, the scamper along the bank, the radiant transformation of earth, air and water, when suddenly the sun was with them again, and the grey was gold, and the colour was born and sprang out the earth once more. They recalled the languorous siesta of hot midday, deep in green undergrowth, the sun striking through in tiny golden shafts and spots, the boating and bathing on the of the afternoon, the rambles along dusty lanes and through yellow cornfields, and the long, cool evening at last, when so many threads were gathered up, so many friendships rounded, and so many adventures planned for the morrow. There was plenty to talk about on those short winter days when the animals found themselves around the fire. Still, the mole had a good deal of spare time on his hands. And so, one afternoon, when the rat in his armchair before the blaze was alternatively dozing and trying over rhymes that wouldn't fit, he formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wild wood, and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with Mr Badger. 
It was a cold still afternoon with a hard steely sky overhead when he slipped out of the warm parlour into the open air. The country lay bare and entirely leafless around him, and he thought that he had never seen so far and so intimately into the insides of things as on that winter day, when, ne when nature was deep in her annual slumber and seemed to have kicked the clothes off. Copses, dells, quarries and all the hidden places, which had been so mysteriously mines for exploration in leafy summer, now exposed themselves and their secrets pathetically, and seemed to ask him to overlook their shabby poverty for a while, till they could riot in rich masquerade as before, and trick and entice him with their robbed deceptions. It was pitiful in a way, and yet cheering, even exhilarating. He was glad that he liked the country undecorated, hard and stripped of his finery. He had got down to the bare bones of it, and they were fine and strong and simple. He did not want the warm clover and this play of seeding grasses. The screens of quickset and billowy drapery of the beech and elm seemed best away. And with the great cheerfulness of spirit he pushed on towards the wild wood, which lay before him low and threatening, like a black reef in some still southern sea. There was nothing to alarm him first. Twigs crackled under his feet. Logs tripped him, funguses on the stumps resembled caricatures, and startled him for the moment by their likeness to something familiar and far away, but that was all fun and exciting. It led him on, and he penetrated to where the light was less, and the trees crouched nearer and nearer, and the holes made ugly mouths at him on either side. Everything was very still now. The dusk advanced on him steadily, rapidly, gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be draining away like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder and indistinctly when he first thought he saw a face, a little evil wedge-shaped face, looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace, telling himself cheerfully not to begin imagining things, or there would be simply no end to it. He passed another hole and another and another, and then, yes, no, yes, certainly a little narrow face with hard eyes, had flashed up for an instant from a hole and was gone. He hesitated, braced himself up for an effort and strode on. Then suddenly, as if it had been so, if it had been so all the time, every hole, far and near, there were hundreds of them, seemed to, and there were hundreds of them, seemed to possess its face, coming and going rapidly, all fixing on him glances of malice and hatred, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. If he could only get away from the holes in the banks, he thought, there would be no more faces. He swung off the path and plunged into the untrodden place of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him when he first heard it. But somehow it made, but somehow it made him hurry forward. Then still very faint and shrill, it sounded far ahead of him, and made him hesitate and want to go back. As he halted in indecision, in indecision, it broke out on either side, and seemed to be caught up and passed on throughout the whole length of the wood to its farthest limit. They were up and alert and ready, evidently, whoever they were. And he, he was alone and unarmed and far from help, and the night was closing in. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first, so slight and delicate was the sound of it. Then, as it grew, it took regular rhythm. And he knew it, for nothing else but the pat-pat-pat of little feet, still a very long way off. Was it in the front or behind? It seemed to be the first one, and then the other, then both. It grew and it multiplied, till from every quarter, as he listened anxiously, leaning that way and that, it seemed to be closing in on him. As he stood still to hearken, a rabbit came running hard towards him through the trees. He waited, expecting it to slacken pace or to swerve from him in a different course. Instead, the animal almost brushed him as it dashed past, his face hard set, his eyes staring. Get out of this, you fool. Get out, the mole heard him mutter as he swung round the stump and disappeared down a friendly burrow. The pattering increased till it sounded like sudden hail on the dry leaf carpet spread around him. The whole wood seemed to be running now, running hard, hunting, chasing, closing in round something or somebody. In panic he began to run too, aimlessly. He knew not whither. He ran up against things, he fell over things and into things. He darted under things and dodged round things. At last he took refuge in the deep, dark hollow of an old beech tree, which offered shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety, but who could tell? 
Anyhow, he was too tired to run any further and could only snuggle down in the dry leaves which had drifted into the hollow and hope he was safe for a time. And as he lay there panting and trembling and listened to the whistlings and patterings outside, he knew at last, in all its fullness, that dread thing which the other dwellers in field and hedgerow had encountered here and known as their darkest moment, the thing the rat had vainly tried to shield him from, the terror of the wild wood. Right, guys, we'll leave it there. What will happen to Mole? Will the strange patterings and whistlings come to him? What are making those strange patterings and whistlings? We'll find out in the next episode. Keep happy, keep reading, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.